Good morning, church. Good morning. So good to see you guys. Mark, I think your microphone is still on. Um, one of the biggest struggles that I have in my life, and anybody will tell you this, is keeping my big fat mouth shut. One person who will especially say amen to this and who is probably watching online right now is my mother. You see, I would always get in trouble as a kid, but one of the main things that I always got in trouble for was back talking. And there was one particular instance where my mom, um, as we got older, and as I still, as I still couldn't learn to just not back talk, she thought the best way to teach me to not do such a thing was to write sentences. And, and this may seem like a kind of lax punishment to some people, but let me tell you, this was the thing that made me finally figure it out. And there's one particular instance where I did something that I had repeatedly done in the past that I had to learn to stop doing. And that is, I left my socks on the floor. Again, this wasn't the first time that it happened. And so my mom said, hey, listen, here's what you're going to do. You are going to write... 50 times, I will not leave my socks in the floor. Now, if you know me at all, if you know me well, you can guess what my first response to that was. Only 50? <laughs> to which my mom, of course, responded, well, how about 100? To which I responded, oh, is that all you got? And it built up and built up and built up to eventually I had to write 2,000 times, I will not leave my socks on the floor. And it took me the better part of a week. In James 3, where we're at today, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there with me. James 3 is all about how we talk. And I'll repeat this a couple of times in the sermon, but here's what James 3 is not. James 3 is not, don't cuss. Now, I think other parts of the Bible address this issue, but that's not what James 3 is about. James 3 is something that, as Christians, we actually don't talk about enough, and it's this. Be careful how you talk about, around, and to other people. We'll get into that in a minute. Before we dive in, I want to talk about the whole book of James. Here's the question that surrounds James. Um, why? Why is the book written? You see, when it comes to the scriptures, um, I was actually having a conversation with a buddy when I was visiting a friend in Oklahoma this last weekend, and the, I, I met up with another friend from Oklahoma, his name's Caleb, and we're having this conversation. Caleb's finishing up his uh, time online at Ozark Christian College, my alma mater, and he um, is, is thinking about kind of starting his master's degree right away because he's a non-traditional student, he's a little bit older, and he just wants to you know, kind of keep going. And um, his, he said to me, I just want to know the Bible more. And so I'm really, really thinking about uh, majoring in like biblical languages in Hebrew and Greek. And I looked at him and I said, um, maybe don't. And here's why. While, while Greek and Hebrew are hard and, and they're valuable to know when studying the Bible, here's what we find. Here, let me put it this way. I took Greek in college and I had to translate the entire book of John throughout the semester. And when I translated the book of John, guess what it was? Uh, it was actually just the English Standard Version. I wrote the English Standard Version again. You see, what I mean is this. Um, when you translate the Bible from the original language, what you get pretty much is this. You see, the, the translators are pretty good at what they do. And there's really very rarely a time where you look at the Bible in the original language and you're like, wow, I didn't even see it from this perspective before. Sometimes you do. But do you know really what you need to see the Bible from the, like a fresh, clear, transformative perspective? You need the history. You need the background. What really makes the Bible come alive is where you place yourself in the shoes of the original readers and you understand the things that they believed, the things that they loved, the way that they lived, and, and, and you begin to put yourself in their shoes and you understand what this text really means. And so that's what we have to do when we come to James. So here's the question about the book of James. What, like, what is it? What's going on? Who are the original readers? Who is the writer? And what do they say? And we know the original writer is a guy named James. Probably, the text says... The, the brother of Jesus. Who are the original 
hearers. Well, it says to the twelve scattered tribes. What this probably means is it's the very earliest church, and it's mostly Jewish still, but there's Roman people starting to join, and it's just kind of a, a book to the whole church. So then what's the situation that's being, it's being written into? Because the question is this, is James just a shotgun? Is James just a shotgun of a bunch of different teachings spread out, of, uh, and they are really in, not interconnected, and it's just kind of a bunch of different pieces of wisdom? Or is there a string that connects everything that goes through the book? I think there is, and here's what it is. Um, uh, if you're at all familiar with the birth of Jesus, you are familiar with the character, the, the guy by the name of Caesar Augustus. As Caesar Augustus comes into power in Rome and really unites the Roman Empire. And as he unites the Roman Empire, there is a lasting peace. There's really not a lot of expansion of the empire. There's not a lot of wars. There's not a lot of infighting. He brings peace. And as such, it becomes problematic to gain power and to gain influence as a Roman. Because the way as a Roman that you gain power and influence is you go to war. And you do brave acts. And you gain land and you gain money and you gain wealth and you become influential. But if you don't have those wars happening, if you don't have Roman expansion, how do you gain power and influence? And here's what happens. There are these things that are started called collegia. Now, college is where we get the English word college, but it's not really an educational institution. It's a club. And you would join these clubs, and you would move yourself up in clubs to gain influence and gain power and to gain standing in the community. It, it was a way to gain honor. Now, what, what happened was, and the problem is, is that as the church begins to expand, people begin to see the Christian church as another collegia. As Romans start to join these things, they see it as a social club to gain wealth and honor and notoriety. And this most definitely would have led to conflict and the butting of heads in the early church. Especially if you have a group of people who genuinely want to follow Jesus, and, they, those are, and, and, and then you have those that are there for social advancement. And this fits into the context of James. I mean, think about what we talked about last week. In James 1, uh, it says this, Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich, the powerful, should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant, its blossoms fall, and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. There seems to be this thing in the background, rich and poor, honored and powerful, and those who are humble in circumstances, and James is addressing it. In James 1, it also says, don't just be a listener of the word, but a doer also. And there's this idea of people just kind of joining just to hear and being a part of the club, and they're not acting out the things and teachings that they're hearing. And then in James 2, what Jared touched on last week, faith and deeds. There's this idea, possibly, so you know, James talks about faith without works is dead. And you say you have faith, and, then I have, and, and, and there's, these, there's this combat between faith and deeds. And it seems to be, um, and Jared touched on this, it seems to be this issue of like, but Paul says we're not saved by works, we're saved by grace through faith. Here's what I think James is using works and faith as. I think he's talking about faith, when it's your faith, when your membership to Christianity is simply a membership card. When it's simply a thing that you can pull out and say, I'm a Christian, I belong to that college year. I belong to that group, that social club. And you use it, and this was especially true 20, 30 years ago in the American Christian Church. It was a place where you'd go to find friends and find community and even find business connections. And that's not really, uh, that's happening less and less in the Christian church as Christianity becomes less and less the cornerstone of our society. But what we do know is this, that there are still people in this very room right now who their motivation in coming to church is really that their friends come. And it's a thing for social advancement. And James pushes back a little bit against that. That faith isn't just a membership card. That if your faith isn't, if your membership card isn't backed up by you acting and becoming like the group that you're joining and becoming like the leader of the group that you're joining, Jesus, then your membership card is meaningless. Now, James 2 also says this, My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Think about this club thing that we've been talking about. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, 
But say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Do you, you see this dynamic? Right? Where there's people who are favorited, the rich and the powerful and those with honor, and they want to continue to climb. And then the people in humble circumstances who are kind of ignored on the margins. Right? This is a trap that has plagued the Christian church since its foundation. Where we have been a people who we value the people who seem talented, and who seem to have stuff. We invest in the people, and then the people who struggle. And the people on the margins get put on the margin. And James pushes back against this. And so you have this whole situation broiling where you have this group of people who are trying to join the church for social advancement and decline. Now, boring book report I just gave you is to set the foundation for the power of what James is going to get into in James chapter 3. Here's the truth. If you're joining a church, early church, for social advancement, what position are you going after to gain advancement? It's the role of teacher, pastor, leader. Because then you're the one at the top. Then you're the one with the power. And that's where James 3 picks up. Let's dive in. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways, and anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. It starts out, we shouldn't all be teachers. Why? Because we shouldn't all be people who are pursuing position in the church for power. We should always be people who pursue humility to look like Jesus. Uh, but what's going on here is more than meets the eye. You see, James is writing to people who are trying to be teachers. They're the ones who in James chapter 2 are showing favoritism. And they're the ones talking about people in ways that they shouldn't. And that's going to become clear in a minute. So you shouldn't all become teachers. Why? Because we're going to be judged more harshly. James goes on to say that like, we all stumble in many ways. And anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. If you are someone who is trying to build yourself up to be proud and to be powerful in the church, then you are going to be somebody who makes yourself out to be perfect. And James is saying the only people who are perfect is anyone who is never at fault in what they say. And who is never at fault in what they say? Nobody in this room. Not me, not 2,000 sentences guy. You know, like, this, James is talking about an impossibility. Why? Because people who try to make themselves out to be better than that they actually are always fail because no one is really that great compared to Jesus. So you shouldn't all become teachers. Why? Because you'll be judged more harshly. That's a tall order. Especially for people who aren't actually interested in teaching, but in power and authority and influence. And James goes into a few metaphors to illustrate this point. Verse 3. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body and sets the whole course of one's life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. James starts out with three illustrations. The first is a horse and a bit. Now, I don't know about you. I have never ridden a horse. Um, uh, I, they scare me, to be honest. Uh, when I was a kid, we had this opportunity in elementary school to go and ride horses, and I sat off on the side because I was not interested. I thought they were going to kick me in the head like I had seen on TV shows. Uh, horses freak me out a little bit. But the, the cool thing about horses is that if you want to guide horses, you just have to have something about this big. Just this big. A huge animal, this big. And you put the bit into their mouth, and then you pull on it in a certain direction, and it turns this whole animal. And James has another illustration in a similar fashion to a boat and a rudder. Now, ancient boats, ancient sailboats had a rudder in the back. And it was this little piece of wood in the back of the boat that you would turn in a certain direction, and it would cause the boat to turn with it. Two things to say. Small thing turns big thing, right? And then lastly, he talks about a forest fire started by a small spark. 
Just this little bit of bright heat sets miles and miles and acres and acres of land on fire. All this to say, the tongue is a small thing that can do immense damage. The tongue is like a bit and a rudder and a spark. And that it turns big things and sets big things on fire. Keep in mind the context. This is probably a group of people who are trying to make themselves higher and bigger than they actually are, talking badly about people who are different or lower than them. To gain power and to gain influence. But James seems to say here, you don't know how much damage you're doing. Now, the whole time I've been talking, you may have been saying, I'm not someone who tries to gain power and influence. But if you've ever been in a conflict, you are. Because when you come into a conflict, your goal is always to win. To be the victor. To be the one on top. When you fight with a spouse, when you fight with a kid, kids, when you fight with your parents, your goal is to win. To be on top. And James used to push back and say, no, the goal is not to talk about such people in such a way as to be on top, but to make yourself low like Jesus. He'll talk about that in a minute. James has one more metaphor. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. Another illustration, humans easily tame animals. Um, uh, it, it's crazy to me the type of things that people keep as pets. I was watching a video. I sent it to my dad because he, my dad loves when monkeys do people things. It's one of his favorite things. And, uh, and so I sent it to my dad. It's like this guy who's trained his monkey and, he, and this video, it, like his monkey has this bean bag. He bought a bean bag for this monkey. And this monkey's just like laying out like asleep on a bean bag wearing a diaper. And it's just, I knew my dad would find it funny. But it's just crazy to me that, like, that, that there are these animals, these wild, crazy animals that people keep as pets. I mean, and yet, we've tamed tigers, and we've tamed lions, and we've tamed monkeys, but we have never been able to tame the tongue. In other words, words have always caused families to break apart, friendships to end, churches to split, and wars to start. It is words, not action, that starts conflict. And we all know this. Like, we know what it means to not have a tame tongue. We all know what it means to be fighting with somebody and to say something that you don't mean. Or to say something that you do mean, but you didn't want to say. And you fly off the handle. And, and, and we know what it means to not have a tame tongue. And when we shoot our mouth off, and like James says, it starts a forest fire. Taking this back to the role of teacher. But not just teacher, leaders in the church, elders and deacons. And if we're being honest, the most important role of leading other Christians in the church, parents. Your role is to teach. Your role is to lead. These are all positions, things that you are, in which you have a responsibility to teach other Christians about Jesus. And with that responsibility comes another responsibility. You know things about Jesus and you know Jesus more. You know his heart and his wants and his word. And it means that you're bound to keep it. And James acknowledges we're all going to fail at this. But he stresses, and it's so important to keep a tight rein on our mouths. Because these are things that we teach from. And how can our churches, our classes, small groups, our kids that we teach, learn from us about Jesus and how much he loves them, cherishes them, and wants them with him forever. And then from those same mouths hear that they are not worth being kind to that they are not worth being patient with, that they are not worth loving like Jesus loves them. James has a few more metaphors that he wants to use to drive this point home. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can salt produce fresh water. James just starts shotgunning out metaphors to drive one point home. You can't mix loving Jesus with hating others. The two greatest commandments are not separate. If you cannot love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and not love others as yourself, 
And you will never truly love others as yourself if you don't love God with everything that is in you. You can't express the gospel of Jesus that invites all people in and talk about how great and how loving and wonderful Jesus is, and in the next moment, disrespect and dishonor the people made in His image. You see, this isn't talking about foul language. Again, the Bible talks about that in other places. And the issue with that is less the words you speak and more the self-control you don't have. But this is talking more about how fresh water and salt water, they can't be mixed. That when you mix both of those, it all ends up being salt water. That when you praise Jesus in this church and stand and sing songs and then go home and talk to your kids like they're trash, and when you sing words, sing words in praise to Jesus in this church and then go and talk to your waitress like she's a dog after church and not leave a tip, that you are mixing two types of water and they do not mix. How can we praise Jesus and talk to people in such a way that He would not even dream of talking like? You can't mix the water. Neither can kind words and mean words mix. They're all going to be mean. Why? Because they flow out of us. This goes back to producing good fruit. The faith without works is dead. See, the Bible says that out of the mouth, the heart speaks. In other words, what you say and how you mean what you say come out of your heart. So here's the thing. We understand James's flow of thought. But there is this issue of people trying to gain power and influence in the church. And they're showing favoritism because of it. And they're trying to become teachers. And these teachers are hyping some people up and tearing some people down. And these positions are being grabbed for influence. So what's the answer to that? If you're like me, and you're the type of person who gets angry, subs their toe, screams and hollers, you're the type of person who gets wronged at a stop sign, and you yell at the person in front of you, what's the answer? I mean, is the answer just try harder? Because if it is, this is the only time in the Bible where that's the reality. Just, just grit your teeth and be, be a better person. No, I don't think the answer is that. And this is where I think the two halves of James 3 connect. Let's, let's dive in a little bit deeper. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. Do you hear that? Let me repeat it again. Who is wise and understanding among you? That language is teacher language, preacher language, leader language. Because it is our teachers and our leaders who are wise and understanding among us. How do we show that then? Not by being smart, but by deeds done in humility that come from wisdom. It's the opposite of unkind speech, isn't it? The kind of speech in which you try to build yourself up by moving yourself higher in the social club that we call church. Pride is the opposite of humility. And we do deeds done in humility that come from wisdom. In other words, the way that you become a good teacher in Jesus, not just someone from a stage, but as a parent, is not by making yourself out to know more and be smarter and be this wise sage in God. The way that you do it is by washing other people's feet. By deeds done in humility that come from wisdom. It says this, but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder, every disorder and every evil practice. See, there's this teacher language again, this pride, this building yourself up language again, envy and selfish ambition. You see, these are people trying to gain positions of influence. But, but James says this wisdom does not come from heaven. In fact, he says it's demonic, that it's from hell. And this makes sense because everything that has come from Satan is about building himself up and tempting you to do the same. Right? Fall, Garden of Eden. The, the, Satan tempts Eve with, hey, if you eat this, you'll be like God, building yourself up. Same thing happens with Jesus in the wilderness. 
Where Jesus is in the wilderness and Satan is like, hey, bring those angels. Show us them power. They'll save you. Hey, if you bow down and worship me, I'll give you all of this. Power and influence. And Jesus recognizes the truth biblically that is hard for us to recognize because we don't see the world working that way. That the way that you gain power and influence is not by taking it. It's not by violence. That the way that you gain power and influence long-term, eternally, kingdom of God is by denying yourself of it. By humbling yourself. Like Jesus humbled Himself by taking on the very nature of a servant and dying on a cross. That's not how the kingdom of God works. The kingdom of God does not work by grabbing power. It works backwards. Influence is gained in the kingdom of heaven by making yourself humble, by getting low, by taking on the nature of a servant. It looks like a cross. That's what James describes next. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. You see, this is wisdom that treats others with consideration and kindness. Here's what I think James is actually getting at, though, when he says this. Listen to his language again. The wisdom that comes from heaven. If you have any knowledge of the Bible and the Gospels, when you hear comes from heaven, what do you think of? Who do you think of? You think of God becoming flesh. You think of the God of the universe who created all things and holds all things up by His power in which if He stopped existing, atoms would fly apart, becoming flesh, putting on this body that we have and dying on a cross, humbling Himself. You see, I think when James says the wisdom that is from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere, when James says that he's describing true wisdom that came from heaven, and the true wisdom that came from heaven is Jesus. James is saying that true wisdom come from heaven is in and personified and most clearly seen in the person of Jesus. And the answer for how we treat others is not grind our teeth. It's not try harder. It's not pull yourself up by your bootstraps. The way that we change, the way that we stop being the kind of person who screams at our families when we stub our toe is by fixing your eyes on Jesus. Because your problem is not that you are doing the wrong thing. The problem is, is you're focusing on the wrong person. Because when you are upset in traffic, because when someone at work wrongs you, your focus is entirely on them and what they've done, and you block out the other people in your life. And so when like a spouse wrongs you and you're fighting and screaming, you're not even looking at the kids and how they're acting and how they're reacting to it. And it is in the moment where you calm down and you look around at the people around you, the people at work who, who saw you just get into a screaming match with a coworker, and you realize, I'm focusing on the wrong thing. I'm being inconsiderate of my coworkers. I'm being unloving towards my wife when my kids are around. You lose focus on what's really important. And in the grand scheme of things, when you focus on other people and you focus on how they've wronged you, you don't fix your eyes on Jesus, who was constantly wrong and constantly taken advantage of and who always humbled himself and never pushed back. I'm going to give you guys... Have you guys seen The Chosen? If you haven't, you need to. It's really good. It is, a, um, it is the first bingeable TV show about Jesus. There's one, season, one and a half seasons out. And uh, I'm going to give you a spoiler from this most recent episode. I'm sorry, Mark pointed it out and he seemed rather frustrated with me. He'll get over it. Um, in this most recent episode... Now, now, not every episode is like they're just going through a biblical text and acting it out. Um, Often there's episodes that kind of just are character building, and that's okay because it's not making itself out to be the Bible. It's just telling the story of Jesus. And so in this episode, what you, see, you don't see Jesus until the end. All you see is his tent, and he's out in this field, and there's just hundreds of people lined up waiting to get healed by Jesus. 
There's people who have been lame since birth and can't walk. There's people who are lepers. There's people who are they're broken and they're suffering and they are genuinely sick and people with cancers and people with tumors and, 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 and possessed people. And just, they're just lined up around the block, hundreds of them. And, and you can tell, like, Jesus is going to be working all day on this thing. And, 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 and even the disciples who, are, who the episode kind of focuses on as they're kind of walking around and as they're doing stuff, like, they're even saying, like, man, how, long, how much longer he's going to be? He's been working all day. I'm sure he's tired. And so as, as the day goes on, the disciples are kind of taking shifts. Um, they're, they're kind of doing crowd control. They're kind of walking along the crowd, making sure everybody's okay, nobody's going to cause a ruckus. And while they're taking shifts, everybody else is back at camp, and they're kind of just talking and reflecting on the day. But as the sun begins to set, actually Jesus' mother shows up, and she comes, and she's like, well, what are we going to eat? And so she starts fixing dinner, and they all sit down around a camp, and they eat dinner. And they're kind of reflecting on their journey. On, hey, remember when Jesus called me? And, and hey, they ask Mary, like, what was it like when he was born? And she, she kind of talks about how uh, it, it was hard because um, we didn't know what was going on. And, and, but, but I got to be his mom, and, and it was cool to be his mom. And, and yet, um, as he grew, I knew that he didn't need me anymore. And that's hard because I still want to be mom. But I'm still excited for what he's going to do. And then it, it kind of... It, it, it kind of moves, and the group begins fighting. And there's this background where Peter and, and Simon, who will be Peter, and, and James and John are fighting because they feel wronged by Simon Peter because Simon Peter was going to betray them to the Romans. Watch the series. And then everybody starts yelling at Matthew because Matthew's the tax collector because he's the one who has wronged the people because he's the one who's taken advantage of others because he's hurt people by stealing from God's people and by betraying God's people to the Romans. And they're just screaming and they're hollering and they're, and they're yelling. I mean, they're about to throw fists. And then you see and hear footsteps. And you see Jesus saunter. Saunter in and walk towards his tent and he kind of just goes, good night. And he's just covered in sweat. And he's got blood on his hands. And he leans against his tent and he tries to take his sandals off. And they're covered, in, his feet are covered in blisters. And Mary gets up, and this is a sweet moment where she's able to help her son once again. She kind of helps him take his shoes off, and she washes his feet. And he looks at her and says, I'm so tired. And she puts him to bed, and he prays and falls asleep, and the disciples are silent. Because they'd been screaming and fighting and yelling at each other. And the minute they fixed their eyes on Jesus and what he was really about, but helping the least of these and the humble. They didn't have a word to say. Our problem with how we talk about other people, either behind their back or to their face, is that we are looking at the wrong thing. It's not about trying harder. It's about changing your sight. So church, let's fix our eyes on Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy sat before him endured the cross scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the Father. Let's look to Jesus, our true and humble King. Let's pray. Father God, we just repent right now of how we've talked about and to other people. God, we, we repent of every time that we've tried to win a fight or we've tried to bring someone down because they upset us. And we want to do better. Lord, we, we, we want to be humble people. And so we ask you to humble us. Lord Jesus, help us to fix our eyes on you. Because you are the one. You are the one who is the wisdom from heaven. And we want to be wise people. We want to be humble people who love others like you have loved us. Move in us, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.